They blew the family apart and led to accusations of murder. It was an ending that could not have been foreseen from the romantic way the story started. Michelle Summers was a fresh-faced beauty queen from California, a sometime model with a string of suitors. But it was a handsome aspiring doctor named Martin McNeil who made her fall hard and fast. They eloped when Michelle was 21 and soon afterward started a family. She had four kids in five years, so we were just mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Alexis and Rachel McNeil grew up idolizing their father. We thought, what an inspiration to become a doctor, to become a lawyer. I wanted to, you know, follow in my father's footsteps. I always wanted to be a doctor, just like him. A doctor who didn't just help heal his patients, but who also taught Sunday school at their local Mormon church, and who seemed to have a heart big enough to adopt three young Ukrainian orphans, El, Giselle, and Sabrina. So from the outside looking in, it sounds like the perfect family. Yeah. If you're thinking it seems too good to be true, you're right. Take a closer look at the picture perfect patriarch and a different image begins to emerge. Not the typical father. He was just very, um, very haughty, stern, kind of haughty, arrogant. Mm -hmm. He thought anyone that was not at his educational stature was very beneath beneath him mm -hmm. he, he treated them very poorly the only two things i want you to learn in school number one how to use the english language effectively number two how to how to effectively use money when the family moved to the utah community of pleasant grove next door neighbors doug and christy daniels couldn't help but notice the contrast between martin and michelle she was very quiet it was always very pretty and very well kept all the girls were just dressed perfect like a tea party but the Daniels say Martin was a braggart and a bore. If Martin was ever around, it was him that, that always dominated every conversation. You could tell that he had a huge ego. He just made sure to say that he was downsizing into his home and that he was a doctor and a lawyer. Michelle's sister Linda and niece Jill noticed it too. He seemed arrogant to me. Like he walked in the room and sort of took it over. Like he thought he was um, better than everybody else. Yeah wasn't anybody that you'd ever want to be around. Martin's adoring daughters often found themselves apologizing for their dad. Everybody hated him. Everyone hated and him. I, I was constantly trying to explain my father. When he'd come home, he was a completely different person. Mm -hmm. So we thought we knew the real person. And Michelle McNeil thought she knew and loved the real Martin, too. Did any of you ever feel like you could say, Michelle, I there's something about this guy that we don't like. We did try to warn her, and there was no talking to her. It was like he had his grips around her. He had total control. It was when Martin turned 50, his daughters say, that the quirks they'd always defended turned stranger. He became obsessed with the way he looked. He started um, tanning a lot. You mean going to tanning salons? Tanning. tanning salons. He lost weight. He lost weight. He'd start exercising just all the time, just mm -hmm. in the middle of a conversation, jumping and doing push-ups, things like it's that. It's really bizarre. I mean, really very, strange. Very out of the ordinary. How did your mom react to all this behavior all of a sudden, this focus on physicality? She, she was suspicious. And even more suspicious as Alexis was when their father began disappearing for long stretches. This seemed less like a midlife crisis and more like an affair. When Alexis says Michelle confronted him about it, Martin made what seemed like the ultimate effort to change the topic. Newly fit and supremely tan, Martin told Michelle she should do some improving of her own. Your dad decided that your mom should get a facelift. Out of the blue. And my mom had never talked about that before or anything. She'd never been into plastic surgery. So how much convincing did it take for your mom to agree to this? Quite a bit, actually. She saw my dad tanning, getting all in shape. So I think, you know, my mom was just a little concerned too. Oh, well, maybe I should do a couple things. You know, maybe that will help. Wavering but wanting to keep her husband happy, Alexis says Michelle reluctantly agreed to the facelift. And my mom said, you know, Martin, let's just wait until the summer. I would be home from medical school for the, my summer break, and so I could help with the recovery. And my dad said, oh, no, Alexis, you have spring break coming up in a week. Let's do it then. In a week? 
My dad said, we have everything set up. You know, the anesthesiologist is reserved. We need to do it. April 3rd, 2007. Just two weeks after Alexis says her father first suggested it, Michelle undergoes a full facelift. Alexis says Martin insists the surgeon prescribe a powerful combination of painkillers and sedatives almost never taken to recover from this kind of procedure. And the surgeon agreed? He knew my dad was a physician, so he thought he knew how to, you know, dose different medications. It was just bizarre because, yeah, my mom was very sensitive to medication anyway. Alexis, away at medical school in Nevada, came home to care for her mother, but the evening after the surgery, she says her father abruptly told her to leave. He said, I, I need you to get some rest, Alexis. And I said, no, I want to stay right here by my mom. And he told me, I'll take care of her, her medicines tonight. You say that the next morning when you saw your mom, she was heavily medicated. She was completely sedated and out of it. And she said, Alexis, you know, your dad, he just kept giving me medicines. And I went right to my dad. And he goes, oh, well, oh, I don't know. I must have done something wrong. Hmm. And he said, oh, and your mother threw up. So then I gave her more medicine. I said, dad, don't give her any more medicine. I'm, I'm going to take over. Alexis spends the next four nights taking care of her mother and monitoring her medication. Michelle seems to be feeling better. But one morning, as Alexis was washing her mother's hair, she says Michelle dropped a bombshell. She started to cry. She said, if anything happens to me, make sure it wasn't your dad. And I said, Mom, what do you mean? You know, what are you saying? And she just said, you know, make sure if anything happens to me, it wasn't your dad. Alexis alone knows her mother's terrible secret fear, but Alexis would soon discover her father was keeping secrets too. When we come back, phone records reveal he was making calls at all hours of the day and night to the same number. Who was on the other end of the line? And a crisis hits the McNeil home. I said, Dad, what's going on? Is it something with mom? And he said, Rachel, come home. Stay with us. After years of seeming picture perfect, life in the McNeil household has gotten strange. Dr. Martin McNeil has become obsessed with his appearance and mysteriously disappears for long stretches of time. Even more alarming, his wife Michelle has confided to their daughter Alexis that she believes Martin may be trying to kill her. Still, just days after surgery, all seems to be well. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Michelle McNeil is recovering from a facelift her daughters say she had only to please her husband, Martin. Daughter Alexis gets ready to go back to medical school, still troubled by a strange warning she says her mother gave her about her father. But she is happy that Michelle appears to be on the mend. The doctor said she was healing great. She looked great. Went out to Sizzler. She had a, you know, a steak dinner. She was feeling great. They dropped me off at the airport. Um, you know, I just remember looking back and seeing my mom and waving. But the next morning, less than 24 hours later, there would be a 911 call from the McNeil home. Okay, is she conscious? <laughs> Martin McNeil, a prominent local doctor, sounds frantic. She is unconscious. She's on the water. Okay, did you, did you get her out of the water? I can. I just the water out. Veteran 911 dispatcher Heidi Johnson is on the line. It was really hard to understand him because he was yelling very hysterically at me. Okay, is she breathing at all? So I tried to calm him down and tried to get information from him. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I'm doing it. Okay, do not take... But he didn't want to stay on the line with me and he hung up. In fact, Martin hangs up not once, but three times in less than five minutes. And he fails to give an audible address. As a result, Heidi Johnson loses precious minutes figuring out where to send the ambulance. Meanwhile, Martin sends the youngest McNeil child, six-year-old Ada, next door to neighbor Christy Daniels. And she said, um, my dad needs some help. 
It was Ada, just home from school, who first found Michelle unconscious in the bathtub. So I ran in and, you know, followed his voice into the bathroom, and he says, I've already called 911. I need a male's help. A man's help to lift his dying wife from the tub? Crucial time passes as Martin sends Christy to call for her husband, Doug. And I just immediately went straight to her, her legs and grabbed her legs, and Martin grabbed her, her upper body, and we lifted her out of the tub and onto the floor. Doug says it is chaos in the bathroom, with Martin veering from frantic attempts at CPR to fury. He would calmly be uh, doing pus over there, and then, and then he would suddenly have an outburst of, of yelling, you know, why, why, uh, all for a stupid surgery. In the midst of it all, the phone rings. It is Alexis calling from medical school in Nevada. She is surprised when her father answers. He said, uh, your mom, she's in the tub. She's not breathing. I've called an ambulance. And then he hung up. For Alexis, in that moment, her mother's terrible secret fears begin to crystallize. I just dropped all my books and started driving to the airport. And I was just screaming, just screaming killed her that was my first instinct he killed her before you left your mom said if anything happens to me make sure it wasn't your dad who killed me my dad had no idea that my mom had confided in me and I knew I was the only one that knew this so I needed to start figuring out what had happened and protect the rest of my family because my dad was a killer Alexis's older sister, Rachel, has also been trying to call home and finally gets through to her father. I said, Dad, what's going on? Is it something with Mom? And he said, Rachel, come home. And so I called Alexis and um, I said, Alexis, I know it. Mom's dead. I said, she, she's dead. And Alexis said, yes, yes. Stunned and grief-stricken, the two sisters return to their parents' home. Alexis takes Rachel aside. She walked with me into the closet and said, Rachel, dad murdered mom. I know, I know he did. I said, what are you talking about? I thought Alexis might have just been overly emotional over or just devastated. But soon Rachel starts wondering. Her father's story of what happened doesn't seem to add up. Okay, do not make why would this experienced doctor hang up repeatedly on the 911 operator? And why would a seemingly fit man need another man's help to rescue his dying wife? It was very strange to me that he couldn't lift my mother out of the tub because he was finishing the downstairs basement a few days prior and I had helped him lift sheetrock in. Now, both sisters begin to suspect the inconceivable because Alexis tells her sister about something else that happened just two weeks before her mother died. When her father had started to disappear for long stretches, Alexis says her mother asked her to do some late night investigating. While he was sleeping, I went online and printed out all of his phone records. And we found uh, this number um, that he'd been calling a lot. A number being dialed day and night. Alexis did an online search. And it popped out um, the name of the person. And, and it was? Gypsy Jillian Willis. And I was like, who's this? I mean, we thought it was maybe some like stripper or something. Who, who's named Gypsy? Alexis says Michelle confronted Martin about the phone calls to the woman named Gypsy. What did he say? Oh, this was a nurse that he'd worked with, and um, she's actually going to be renting this property that they had leased. And my mom said, well, why have you called her at 3 o'clock in the morning? All these strange hours. Oh, well, she works the night shifts. My mom wasn't happy with his answers. She really didn't believe him. Did she follow up? She, well, she died. On the day of Michelle's death, Alexis begins to question her father. She asks where were those powerful painkillers and sedatives, and how many had her mother taken on a morning when she had been recovering well from her facelift. But I said, where's the medicine? And he said, um, I don't know. I don't know where it is. Check in the garage. But she finds no medications, and when she asks her father again, he says they've been thrown out. And why? It was making, it was making him father. too sad to look at, to see this medication. The medicine? I mean, as soon as I heard that, 
things were just starting to add up. Everything was adding up. Mm -hmm. But if it all looked suspicious to Alexis and Rachel, it did not to the Pleasant Grove police. Detectives collect no evidence from the house and interview no one besides Martin, who they know as a well-established local doctor. He tells them he believes Michelle passed out while preparing the tub. I thought that if this is a, a healthy woman that died, that there would be some sort of big police investigation. Their police report onto my mother's death is about two and a half paragraphs. The medical examiner determines that hypertension and an existing heart infection called myocarditis caused Michelle's heart to fail. In other words, death by natural causes. Natural causes? She's not an old woman. No, She's she just turned 50 years old. I mean, she she had a few issues. She had a little bit of high cholesterol, some high, high blood pressure. Police close the case. Alexis and Rachel are stunned, but their father is moving on, and quickly. He arranges a funeral within three days and just two days after is back at work. And even though Alexis and Rachel say they have offered to come home to care for the four younger McNeil children, their father announces he will hire a nanny. And he already seems to have one in mind. And he said, oh, I found the perfect nanny. And I said, what's her name? And he said, oh, I think it's Jillian. I said, dad, Gypsy Jillian Willis. I said, I know that woman. I know mom was worried you were having an affair with her and you were not to bring her in the home. But Martin would not be deterred. He calls a family meeting. And he said, there is going to be uh, an interview for a nanny. And there was only one candidate and that was Gypsy. Gypsy. Imagine that. Yeah. And she got the job. Two weeks after Michelle died in her bathtub, Gypsy moves in as the family nanny. She didn't cook, she didn't clean, she didn't take care of the children in any way. Just who is Gypsy Willis? Alexis and Rachel start digging, and it seems the nanny, now caring for the McNeil children, has been caring for their father for much longer. And we come to find out that my dad had been dating Gypsy for several years before my mom's death. When we come back, what was it Gypsy was after? And to what lengths would she go to get it? If she wants something, she will hurt anybody who stands in her way. She doesn't care. What lengths would Michelle's daughters go to find out the truth? I'd try to go to the authorities. I'd go to the governor's office. I went to every single newspaper in Utah. And what might their father be capable of doing? He started threatening me. I'm going to take you down. Stay with us. Michelle McNeil has collapsed and died just days after undergoing a facelift. The coroner ruled her death was by natural causes, and police have closed the case. But Michelle's daughters, Alexis and Rachel, suspect their father is responsible for their mother's death. And their suspicions only increase when a new woman appears by their father's side. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. With Michelle McNeil dead and buried, her husband Martin wastes little time. Within two weeks, he moves his girlfriend, Gypsy, into the house, calling her the children's nanny. She walked into the house like she owned the place. And then when I questioned my dad and said, what's going on? He said, oh, she's a guest in our home, and how dare you question me? He said, if you fight me, I'm going to get you thrown out of medical school. And he started threatening me, I'm going to take you down. I was told that I need to leave the home because I, I wasn't nice to Gypsy. We were pushed out of the house Without by my dad. Shoes. I didn't even have shoes on, but not I even didn't. a phone. He wanted to make it known that it was either Gypsy or his children, and he chose the nanny. Yeah. The nanny. Exiled from their own home, Alexis and Rachel are desperate for answers about their mother's death and worried for their sisters. So they create a file on their father. It took a quite a while to create the book. With their Aunt Linda and cousin Jill, they find out about his relationship with Gypsy and his past. Linda goes to see a detective at the Pleasant Grove, Utah Police Department. He said, we're closing the case, you know, sorry. You know, I know that's kind of shocked you because she was young to have a heart attack. Not only did, would they not listen, they were mocking us. They were saying, you're ridiculous. You guys are just upset that, you know, your dad has had an affair. Lots of people have affairs. The women would not give up. For more than a year, they searched for someone to take their suspicions seriously. 
I think you just wake up and you try to do what you can. It is living a nightmare. I try to go to the authorities. I go to the governor's office. I went to every single newspaper in Utah. Why do you think nobody would listen? I have no idea. I, can, I cannot understand why no one would listen. My mother was murdered. She was murdered and no one cares. No one, that is, until they talk to this man. Investigation, is this a Whitney? Veteran investigator Doug Whitney I at the Utah County I Attorney's know, Office. When Whitney reviews what the women have collected, he starts to focus on Martin's relationship with that new nanny. I mean, how did they meet? I think it was on the internet. Like in a chat room or a... Exactly. Whitney and Chief Utah County Investigator Jeff Robinson scour McNeil's phone records and computers. So you'll take the hard drive out. They discover communications going back more than two years, an affair both longer and more torrid than Martin McNeil's daughters ever imagined. What was it about Gypsy that so captivated him? He has this beautiful wife at home. What is he doing risking everything for Gypsy? She is a woman that is driven and probably uh, driven in the wrong direction most of the time. I truly believe that she believed that she could control men by an aura about her. An aura? Yes. So what, did she see herself as the great seductress? Absolutely. There was no question about it. He eventually put her into a, an apartment that he paid for. And then their relationship became very heated. After Michelle's death, Gypsy even took Martin back to Wyoming to meet her parents, Harold and Vicki Willis. He said, I never loved Michelle, but I love Gypsy. And I said, but she had a family with Michelle. He says, actually, I loved her as a friend. I loved her as a sister, but I never loved her like I loved Gypsy. And it was in Wyoming that Martin proposed to Gypsy in front of her family. Gypsy's sister, Julie, was there. He gave this grand speech about how he loved her and how he loved her from the moment he saw her. And he knelt and proposed to her and Gypsy cried. It was very fairy tale. But this was no fairy tale and Gypsy was no princess, says her own family. In her reality, she's always in the right. I would consider Gypsy to be a deceptive, malevolent, malicious, calculating person. Gypsy's family says they'd feuded with her for years. They say Gypsy had once enjoyed killing animals, was fascinated with witchcraft, and even assaulted her mother during an argument over a dog. She lunged forward and she bit me on my upper left bicep. A bad bite. If you count every single tooth mark, she doesn't care who gets hurt. She doesn't care what circumstances are ruined. If she sees something she wants, she will rationalize it to herself to the point where she will get that. And it doesn't matter who stands in her way. And she wanted, says investigator Doug Whitney, was Martin McNeil, married with eight children. Whitney interviewed Gypsy's roommates. She would have a tirade. I've got to get rid of this woman that's between me and this guy. According to the roommate, she talked about cutting the brake lines. If the statements that we're getting are correct, we're talking about a woman who would have done just about anything to have her men. In a bad way, they were perfect for each other. Investigators were trying to determine just how far the couple was willing to go. Together, I believe that they are perfectly capable of killing Michelle. They're like a pack of dogs. One dog alone might be malicious, might take a nip out of things, but two dogs together hunting are lethal. See what's next. While investigating the death of Michelle McNeil, police have uncovered a great deal of evidence about her husband's relationship with his girlfriend, Gypsy. But they're about to find out she was not the only thing Martin McNeil was hiding. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Utah County investigator Doug Whitney wants to know why 50-year-old Michelle McNeil died suddenly, just a week after a routine facelift. What he soon discovers is that her husband, Martin, was not the man he claimed to be. This prominent doctor, lawyer, and leader in this close-knit Mormon community had a life based on three decades of lies, stretching all the way back to his days in college and his school transcript. It appears to me that instead of taking his transcript and altering it, he got somebody else's. The transcript was totally falsified. Falsified? Falsified. It was completely fake? Completely fake. 
Next, Whitney says Martin used phony transcripts to get into medical school in Mexico and later into a medical college in California. In 1984, he landed a residency at a New York City hospital. And from there, he built a 30-year career as a doctor. So this man who proclaimed loudly to anybody who would listen that he was a doctor, you're telling me wasn't? His entire career is based on falsified transcripts from different colleges. Well, so then how did he go about practicing medicine? The guy is brilliant. I'm not saying that he's, that he's not smart. He just didn't take the necessary classes. And, and he lies. But that wasn't all. Martin served in the army in the mid-1970s, but was soon discharged, claiming a psychiatric disorder. Investigators say he was able to collect more than $100,000 in disability payments that increased over the years. How much money are we talking about? It was $3,000 a month. He was getting $3,000 a month? Yes, from the VA. Decades after he served less than two years? Decades. And as Doug Whitney peeled back the layers, he discovered even more. Martin McNeil had a felony conviction for writing phony checks when he was 21. Martin McNeil went on a spree, a shopping spree. Attorney Gary Ryan. He had rented a house and he needed to furnish it. He also bought himself some jewelry, diamond rings, watches, 60 pairs of socks, 20 or 30 pairs of shoes, a year's supply of chocolate-covered cherries. A furniture store employee got suspicious and called police. Martin was arrested and prosecuted by Ryan. I remember him because he was bright and he was a con, and cons always interested me. It's possible to have served 180 days in prison and be on felony probation and keep that a secret from schools or employers? Apparently so. It happened. We basically found out that our entire lives had been based and surrounded on lies, that everything about our experience with our father was a lie. And the con man kept the lies spinning with what would become his biggest ruse. This time, he had the help of the family's new nanny, Gypsy. Their cruel plot involved making one of Martin's adopted daughters disappear. It sounded like a nice idea, sending 16-year-old Giselle back to her Ukrainian homeland for a two-month visit with her biological sister. And that was the plan. My dad had just basically said, you know, we'll get her after the summer. With Giselle gone, traveling on her Ukrainian passport, Martin and Gypsy take her U.S. passport and apply for a new social security card for Gypsy using Giselle's name. They went into court and changed the birth date, 20 years. That's called perjury. Now there's two people with that social security number. There's two people with that name. Next, they change Giselle's birth certificate. Martin claims Gypsy is his daughter, Jillian McNeil. He was able to change the birth certificates around and transfer my mother's house that was still in my mom's name. Investigators believe Martin was trying to put the family home into Gypsy's hands. But as Martin plots, his adopted daughter Giselle languishes in Ukraine, her two-month visit stretching to nearly a year. Back home, her sisters are frantic with worry. So is cousin Jill wants answers. Michelle adopted her for a reason, and that reason wasn't just to have her get shipped back. The Ukraine is nowhere that anybody wants to be. Without telling Martin, Jill travels to Ukraine to check on Giselle herself. You walked in and saw where she had been living. What did you see? There's one room and it has a pull-out sofa bed. And it's her, her sister, her sister's husband, and her, their two kids. And they all share that bed. There was a little pan on the floor. And I was like, what's this in the bathroom? And she's like, that's our shower. You just stand in there. I mean, I don't even know what movie I've ever seen anything that horrible in. So Jill decides on her own to bring Giselle on the long journey back to Utah. Here's Giselle, her last day in Ukraine. To send the daughter that he adopted back to Ukraine and basically abandon her. What kind of person does that? I will simply say that I believe that Mark McNeil is a sociopath. A sociopath and a con, says Whitney, but could he have killed his wife of nearly 30 years? Coming up.
Why was Michelle McNeil's body found in this position? And then later, in this position. And did Martin McNeil have yet another plan? You're talking about a state ID card. You're talking about bank accounts that were opened up under false names, false social security numbers. Stay with us. Despite suspicions that Martin McNeil may have murdered his wife, the police don't have enough evidence to charge him. But he is about to get caught in one of his own deceptions. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Two years after Michelle McNeil's death, her husband Martin and his fiance Gypsy are living out an elaborate plot. They're scheme to change identities. Investigator Doug Whitney right discovers they have stolen Martin's adopted daughter Giselle's identity and are amassing fake IDs all over Utah. You're talking about a state ID card. You're talking about bank accounts that were opened up under false names, false social security numbers, a military dependent identification card. So they could shop in the PX in the commissary? I exactly. Mean... He's playing stupid little games for what purpose? After all, McNeil was a doctor with a comfortable salary, a family, and a reputation. So why risk it? We don't know why these people did what they did because it was so likely that they would be caught. He'd spent a lifetime not getting caught. Can you see them smiling at this, thinking, what a bunch of dummies? Well, they're certainly not smiling now. No. That's because investigators Whitney and Robinson, with the help of Martin's own daughters, put together the evidence of the fraud. January 15, 2009, Martin McNeil is arrested after landing at the Salt Lake City Airport. And he was just headed right off the plane. So at the time of the arrest, he was already making plans to flee the state. That's right. And came back to Utah only because he thought he had a buyer for his house in Pleasant Grove. That's right. McNeil pleads guilty to two counts of aggravated identity theft. Gypsy pleads guilty to a related fraud charge. They are sent to federal prisons in Texas. For Gypsy, a two-year sentence. For Martin, a mandatory four years. The last sentencing hearing, the only thing he said to me is, I hope you're happy, Alexis. I hope you're happy with what you've done. With Martin and Gypsy locked away, Doug Whitney again turns his focus to the death of Michelle McNeil. We have seven computers, a number of telephones, six boxes of documents, 15 pages of witnesses. It's one thing to spend a life committing petty crime, forgeries. It's another thing to murder somebody. Huge step. Probing the possibility that step was taken, Whitney meticulously pieces together the timeline of the morning Michelle McNeil died. At 8.20 a.m., Martin drops off six-year-old Ada at school. Investigators believe he then returns home where he and Michelle are alone for the next half hour. During that time, Michelle calls Alexis. She was saying, oh, you know, Alexis, your dad's being so sweet to me. And I was really happy, you know, I was like, oh, well, good, you know, things are going really well. And I said, you know, I love you, Mom. Just two hours after that call, during which her mother seemed to be fine, Alexis says she gets an alarming phone message from her father. He said, Alexis, you know, your mom, she's not doing anything I say. She's, you know, getting up and out of bed and she's not resting and you need to call her right away. Now worried, Alexis calls her mother, but there is no answer. At around 11.40 a.m., Martin brings Ada home from school. It is then that she makes the shocking discovery. Ada said that my dad told her to go check on your mother. My dad stayed in the kitchen while she went into the bathroom and found her. You realize that if you're right and your father did this to your mother, he sent your little sister in to oh, find her. He we did. know he did. She just turned six. He didn't care about anyone. At 11.46, Martin begins placing three frantic-sounding 911 calls. Conflicting accounts of what happened next are what really piqued investigators' interest. Ada recalls seeing Michelle's body fully clothed. Ada said that, that my mom was in a black or bluish mm -hmm. running suit. But remember, Martin then sent Ada next door to get help. By the time neighbor Christy Daniels arrives, she says Michelle had nothing on but a top. 
When I first saw her, I remember a black long sleeve shirt on and nothing else on. Could Martin have taken the running suit off in the minutes that Ada was gone and why? Alexa says she found the suit in the corner of the garage soaking wet. My mom's things were in the garage, wet towels, the running suit, there was the, the wet running, running suit. suit. What do you think was happening in that bathroom while Ada was going next door for help? I think my dad was trying to cover, cover something up. And something else didn't add up for investigators. The differing accounts of how Michelle's body was positioned in the tub. Ada, who saw her first, says Michelle was on her back. Face, oh, oh. face up in the t bathtub. That was also what neighbors Christy and Doug recall. Michelle was laying on her back in the tub, face up, with her head underneath the faucet and her legs on the opposite end, kind of out of the tub. But Martin's daughters say that day, Martin said something completely different. Your dad said your mom's head was underwater. Yes, laying face, face, face down. down. You mean bent over Both the tub? Dead. Yes. Martin's account would appear to support the theory he had told police that his wife passed out while preparing the tub. Does anybody corroborate Martin's version of events that morning? No. So it's Martin on his own and all the other witnesses on the other side describing pretty much the same scene. That's correct. But in a case that was closed before it was ever really opened, the medical examiner ruled death by natural causes. Pleasant Grove police declined to talk to 2020 about the case, but Chief Utah County Investigator Jeff Robinson says they followed proper procedure. Pleasant Grove Police Department, in my opinion, did a good job. They responded to a, what they believed was somebody in a cardiac arrest. But when you say the Pleasant Grove Police Department did a good job, I mean, they, they didn't look at the scene for any clues. They didn't ask for her prescription medications. They didn't confiscate anything from the scene. What, what, what is it that they did well? Well, you have a doctor on scene. Uh, a doctor who's also the victim's husband. That is correct. Did they interview the next door neighbors who were called to the scene to help? They did not. Did they interview the grown daughters of the couple? No. No. What is it you think your dad did to your mom? I think he drugged her. I don't know exactly what he did, but I do know he killed her. As time passed, the McNeil sisters found themselves trying to move forward with their lives, but the memory of their mother was never far from their minds. Alexis moved back to Utah to start a medical residency. While her desire to become a doctor still ran deep, she didn't want to be known as Dr. McNeil. I'm changing my name to my mother's maiden name, Summers. I will be practicing in the same area that my father worked. I don't want to be associated with him. I don't want to be associated with his name. With her father serving a four-year prison term for fraud, Alexis has also been granted custody of Sabrina, Elle, and nine-year-old Ada. And as the investigation into her mother's death moves forward, authorities may have found, if not a smoking gun, then at least an important clue. They asked a toxicologist to take a second look at what drugs were in Michelle McNeil's system the day she died. When the review came back, it confirmed a highly unusual combination of powerful sedatives and painkillers. Oxycodone, and Valium, Ambien, Ambien and uh, Lortab. If she's feeling better and doesn't like taking these drugs, why would she have these drugs in her stomach on a morning when things are going pretty well? That's a good question. Does that raise suspicions for you? I'd be a very poor investigator if it didn't. Three years after Michelle's death, the Utah medical examiner changed Michelle's cause of death from natural to undetermined with suspicious circumstances. All of Michelle McNeil's sisters, her mother, her daughters, believe that Martin McNeil killed her. What do you think? The reason we have a, a homicide investigation open right now is we believe that there's probable cause, there's foul play involved here, and we believe we're on the right track. Investigators traveled to Texas with some questions for McNeil in federal prison. He refused to talk to them, nor would Martin or Gypsy speak with 2020, despite repeated requests. In the past, Martin has denied he was involved with his wife's death. As for Gypsy, investigators say they are trying to determine if she had any role, but won't say more than that. For now, Martin and Gypsy are behind bars, 
which is where their families hope they will remain. She belongs in a controlled facility.